so fairly. You would steal this special item. And, of course, Judah's like, we haven't stolen anything. And, and the, they say, well, pour out everybody's pack. Well, Judah's fine with that. When they pour out Benjamin's pack, it's in his pack. Well, now he's got to go back. And so when you get to that end of the story, Judah is the one who stands before Joseph and says, look, let me take responsibility for this. I don't know how this happened, but this is our youngest brother. We, we can't let anything happen to him. He has to go home. Judah finally says, just keep me. You can't keep Benjamin, but you can keep me. And so he plays this very fascinating role already in this story as we, as we make our way through it. But then you get to Genesis 49, and that's the text I want us to look at today real quickly as we, before we go back and look at all this that's happened. When you get to Genesis 49, Jacob is at the end of his life, and he brings his boys in to pronounce a blessing over them. Now, he's very familiar with this because this is what he received from his own dad, remember? And so now it's time for Jacob to pass the blessing on to his own sons. And so he brings them all together. But when you get to verse 8 um, of chapter 49, he says, Judah, your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies and your father's sons will bow down to you. Now, Joseph, um, his dream has already come true, right? He's already been in Egypt. The brothers have already bowed down to him. So what was going to happen with Joseph has already already occurred. This is into the future. Verse 9, you are a lion's cub, Judah. You return from the prey, my son. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down like a lioness who dares to rouse him. But then verse 10, the scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he to whom it belongs shall come, and the obedience of the nations shall be his. He will tether his donkey to a vine, his colt to the choicest branch. He'll wash his garments in wine, his robes in the blood of grapes. His eyes will be darker than wine, his teeth whiter than milk. Now there's a whole lot of imagery there that we will get to later when we study Genesis 49, but the one point that I would just make to you if you'll notice the opening part of verse 10 the scepter will not leave Judah the ruler's staff from between his feet until he to whom it belongs shall come and then all the nations will obey him well that of course is going to be pretty quickly viewed as a messianic passage and so Judah has been chosen to be the line of promise from Jacob so the mantle now has been given, not to Joseph, not to Reuben, but to Judah. And so the Messiah now is going to be traced through the lineage of Judah. So consequently, when they finally arrive back in Canaan, the southern portion of Israel, a large portion, the most select portion really, is going to be given to Judah and his family. Consequently, if you fast forward many years hence, when we get to the 700s, 721 B.C., when um, Assyria invades Israel and destroys the northern kingdom, what you'll have left is primarily the land that belongs to Judah's family and his brother Benjamin. And so then the people who actually live there will no longer be known just as Hebrews. They will no longer be known just as Israelites. They'll be known uh, by a shortened version of Judah's name, which is what you call them today. They'll become known as the Jews. So shortened version of this man's name. So to exaggerate Judah's role in the story would almost be impossible to do. Okay, So that's why we get this very interesting, fascinating story about him. Now... Um, if I were the editor, I would have tried to dress the page 38, 38 up a little bit um, because this is such a prominent person. But the Bible, uh, one of the ways that um, I believe that we um, recognize its authenticity is that the Bible tells the story as it is. It doesn't sugarcoat, paint over, gloss over the brokenness of these people. It's a credit to uh, the authenticity of the account. When you read other accounts of ancient peoples, you don't get these kinds of stories. Uh, these kinds of things don't make it off the cutting room floor, so to speak, but they do in the Scripture. So we get this fascinating story about Judah. So, for example, one of the first things we notice about Judah 
in terms of his family lineage. If you look at chapter 38, verse 1, it says, At that time Judah left his brothers, which is quite fascinating. So the many scholars will, will tell you they like to play on the imagery and the similarities in these accounts. And so Joseph has left his brothers, and now Judah is leaving his brothers as well. So there's this narrative connection. And if we were reading this in Hebrew, which as you all all know for me is really, really hard to do, there are multiple phrases that are used in Genesis 38 that connect it to the stories all around it. So it lets us know that Moses is writing this on purpose and is putting it in this story at this very place intentionally. It's not an afterthought. Uh, it's actually a, a, a narrative tool, but it is also a theological one. So Judah, just like Joseph, has now left his brothers. Joseph, not of his own accord. Judah, of his own accord. He went down to stay with a man of Adulam named Herah. And then verse 2, there Judah met the daughter of a Canaanite man named Shua, and he married her and made love to her, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son who was named Ur. Now, what is the wrong with this already? This is, the, this is going to be the line of promise. This is going to be the one who will receive the messianic blessing. And what has he gone and done? Married a Canaanite, of all things. So, um, once again, the frailty of this promise, the uh, brokenness of these characters is just on display in the story. Well, then, um, the text tells us, verse 4, she conceived again. She gave birth to a son, named him Onan. She gave birth to another son, named him Shelah. And it was at Kazib. In other words, he has traveled outside of his father's territory where she has now given him these sons. So he has a Canaanite family. We're not really sure why Judah chose to do this. This is going to introduce Canaanite blood, if you will, into the Messianic line. We'll get to that here in just a minute. Uh, it also feels like an aberration in God's intention and plan for these people because they were supposed to remain with one another. And yet Judah has chosen to marry outside the family, if you will. Then you have this fascinating account of his two boys, Judah's son's evil. Um, we, we read something for the very first time in our Old Testament. Okay, If, if you look at um, verse 6, Judah got a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. Now, as best we can tell, this is a Canaanite woman also. And so, not only is um, Judah's son going to be half um, Canaanite and half Jewish, now his son's wife is full Canaanite, and so the Jewish blood is even being further polluted. Does that make sense? We're, we're going in a in a downhill digression, if you will, away from what presumably we would see as the way God had for these people. But regardless, um, she has these two older boys, and we read something for the very first time in the Old Testament, and that is verse 7. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the Lord's sight, so the Lord put him to death. It's the first person on record we know of that the Lord actually puts to death. And so, as you might imagine, this has led to incredible scholarly debate. A lot of Jewish theological reflection through the years where Jewish theologians have grappled with this. Uh, about what was it that uh, Ur must have done that was worthy of death. Even such judgment from God himself. And the short answer is, we don't know. The text doesn't tell us. And this particular story, if you will, will kind of ride off into obscurity once we leave this page. So we don't really know. What we do know is that what was evidently already in place was an ancient practice that the Jews will adopt. It wasn't invented by the Jews, but it's something that you, the Jews adopted. And that is what's going to be known as leveret marriage. Leveret comes from, a, the, the English word leveret comes from a Latin word which means in-law or brother-in-law, if you will. 
And so, um, if you were to fast forward to the book of the law in Deuteronomy 25, the actual prescriptions of what's supposed to happen in a situation like this are laid out in the law. This is before the law was written. So, but this was already evidently a common practice in the ancient world. And the way it's prescribed in Deuteronomy 25 is if two brothers are living together and one of the brothers dies childless, then the other brother is to take the brother's wife as his wife and he is to have a child through her and that child will then be the namesake of the deceased brother. Then the widow of the brother will be cared for by the inheritance that belongs to the other brother that will be given to her son. Does that make sense? It was a way of protecting a widow in the family who did not have permission to go outside the family and marry, who also had no progeny, had no son, and so was not eligible for the estate from the father. Are y'all still with me? It's called the law of the leveret marriage. It was common in the ancient world. As a matter of fact, when you read accounts of some ancient peoples, this kind of thing existed prior to the Jews adopting it as, as a part of their law. So, again, we're before that's ever been adopted, but it's already seemingly practiced, and it must have been something that God endorsed because he was willing to put it in the book of Deuteronomy. It's actually in the book of the law. So, the problem is, though, that you run into is, I know this is shocking, but sometimes there was jealousy among the brothers. And the brother who was still alive many times would do a calculation in his mind and he would understand that bring one more son into this story and my piece of the future father's pie shrinks. So some brothers would refuse to do this. Okay. Now, the, if you read Deuteronomy 25, um, God already made allowance for that. And the way it worked in, among the Jews once the law was adopted was it spelled out what you're supposed to do. If the brother refuses to consummate a relationship with his brother's widow and he will not fulfill his obligation, then the widow has to go to the elders and say, my brother-in-law will not do this. He will not fulfill the leveret laws. And he is then specifically condemned. And then you are to go back and take off your sandal and spit in his face. Okay? That's what's supposed to happen. And uh, it's a fascinating account you can read about in Deuteronomy 25. So we get to this story, and Onan is the brother, and his brother has died. And so Judah's response to that is, Tamar now belongs to you. You need to have a son through her. And y'all know this story. He almost consummates that relationship several times, but he refuses to do it. Fascinatingly, in the midst of all that, God sees all of that. And decides that his unwillingness, evidently because of his own selfishness, assuming we're reading between the lines here, Onan did not want another kid in the mix to receive more of the inheritance because it would all be his um, if he doesn't have, if she doesn't have any progeny. God sees all that, views that as wicked, and God strikes Onan dead. So the two older boys now have been struck dead. And in Judah's mind, the common denominator is Tamar. Okay? So, look at verse 11. Verse 11, Judas says to his daughter-in-law, Tamar, Go live as a widow in your father's household until my young boy grows up. So, Sheila grows up. But then notice what he thought. He may die too, hanging out with you, like evidently it seems to be what's going on here. So she goes back to her family. Now here's the good news for her. She's not abandoned as a, a widow here without any provision. Judah evidently still sees himself as responsible for her, at least in terms of her future. And he says to her, one day when my son gets old enough, I will give him to you or give you to him. And so she agrees. So she now goes back to live with her father. Now what that means is for her culturally... She's going to live a certain way. She's going to dress a certain way. She's going to carry herself a certain way. She can't, um, she can't go back home to her village and now uh, act like she's a virgin waiting on a husband. 
So she has to dress as a widow. So anytime she goes anywhere, there were certain ways that widows had to mark themselves. And so she will be known as a widow in the community in waiting for a husband that presumably has been chosen for her by her father-in-law. Okay? So that's now her plight. However, because her plight is, is actually more complex than that, because Judah evidently has already decided in his mind he's not going to give her to his youngest child. So basically, she's condemned to a life of barrenness. And the implication is she will outlive her dad, and then she'll find herself kind of in the same circumstances again, an unprotected widow without any kind of inheritance because she would receive that through her husband, not her brother. Are y'all with me? So she is in a pickle, we would say. Okay? And regardless of what you think about Tamar up to this point, Right now, she's just an innocent victim. Wouldn't you agree? We, we know nothing about her right now. This is just a woman whose hand has been dealt to her, and she basically has, has agreed to it. And so she's going to now live her life as, as, as this barren widow without knowing what her ultimate future is going to be and how she's going to be provided for. Okay. Turns out she's a little more wily than we give her credit for being. So if you keep reading the story, Judah's wife dies. So now he's a widower, and um, he's still um, raising sheep and cattle and goats, presumably. He's still engaged in that lifestyle. And so there was a season of the year um, whenever it came time for them to shear sheep. Now, this may sound really strange to you and me, but if you'll, if you'll look at verse 13, Tamar was told, your father-in-law is on his way to Timnah to shear his sheep. Well, um, when it came time for sheep shearing, it's kind of hard to say, sheep shearing, the pagan people associated that with the need to placate the gods so that the gods would bless them with fertility and provide for all of their flocks. And so at these sheep shearing festivals, which is what this was, there were cultic prostitutes who were employed to facilitate the acts of fertility. So this was a sexually promiscuous place, and everybody knew that. So the men that made their way there to this knew that when they arrived, this was going to be kind of like Las Vegas on display. Okay? Guess who else knew that? Tamar. So she knew Judah's wife is dead. He's going to the festival, and more than likely, he might be vulnerable to an invitation. So notice what the text says. Again, she took off her widow's clothes. That tells us she had to dress a certain way as a widow. She covered herself with a veil. We don't really know. There's a whole lot of controversy about that, about what prostitutes did and didn't do, and who could wear veils and who couldn't wear veils. What was the difference between a cultic prostitute? Believe it or not, some of the cultic prostitutes were married, and they did this for a living to help provide for their families. Then they went back home to their husbands once these festivals were over. We have records of all that. But the point is, she made herself known to Judah that she was available. Okay? Because, notice what it says in verse 14. She has figured out that Sheila has grown up and they're not married. So she has figured out that Judah has tricked her. Okay? Okay? Once again, this is kind of woven in the narrative of Jacob's story. There's a whole lot of trickstering that goes on in Jacob's uh, family line, right? And um, so, and Judah has already been in on some of it because he's tricked his dad into believing that his brother Joseph is dead. He's tricked Tamar into thinking that he's going to give her his youngest son when he has no intention of doing it. And now, lo and behold, he's going to be on the other end here. Because she's going to seduce him. Verse 15, when Judah saw her, he thought she was a prostitute. He didn't recognize her. Evidently, several years have passed also. And so he invites her into this relationship. Now, remember, she's pretty wily. And so he then asks her, how much does it cost? What, what do I have to pay? And um, basically... The negotiation, the negotiation is because she says to him, really, what are you going to give me? Because the implication is you're going to give me something. You're going to pay something. He says, I tell you what, I will give you a young goat, but I don't have it yet. 
And she says, uh, no. I tell you what. She said, why don't you give me something that everybody who knows you will know is yours. So Judah was a man of means. And the way that was um, shown in those days was by how you carried yourself and by how you dressed. And so men like Judah would wear this, this special cord that had like a ring or a seal on it that was his seal. And they would also have these specially designed staffs that were designed just for them that they carried with them. And everybody would know that's Judah's. She said, why don't you leave me all that? And Judah says, fine, I can do it. So um, time passes, Judah gets home, and he says, you know what, i got to pay that prostitute. So you get to verse 20. And so Tamar's ploy has happened here. And so now Judah says, send this goat and get my stuff back. She'll be easy to find. She's the cultic prostitute on the road there into Timnah. Describes her. Well, it turns out there's not a cultic prostitute on the road into Timnah. There's actually a grieving widow who's tricking her father-in-law. That's who actually was on the side of the road. She's already gone home and dressed back like a widow. Okay, so when they get there, the guy asks about, look at verse 21. He said, where's that shrine prostitute? And they said, we don't have any shrine prostitutes here. He went back to Judah and said, guess what? There's not one. And then look at verse 23. I love this note. Judah says, let her keep what she has or everybody know that I've been outwitted by a prostitute. So just let it go. And let's just forget about it as if you can forget about it. And in Judah's mind, I did what was right. I sent the goat. Okay, I, I, in other words, I didn't, I didn't deceive her. I sent what I promised I would send. And, um, and now he realizes he's been duped. But then the plot thickens, doesn't it? Here's his predicament. Three months later, Judah's told, hey, now we don't know who all these somebodies are. There's always somebody telling somebody. Y'all know what I mean? Somebody knows something, and they can't help themselves. That's just the world we live in. It was that way then, too. So somebody knew somebody who said, hey, Tamar's pregnant, turns out. And Judas says, really? Well, see, I was planning on saving her. I mean, like he really was. But he still had authority over her. Look at what he says. Bring her out and have her burn to death. If she's going to burn with passion, then I tell you what, we'll burn her to death. Verse 25, once again, um, Tamar is pretty wily it turns out she's held on to all of Judah's property. And so she sent a message to her father-in-law, said, Here, here's the deal. I'm pregnant by the man who owns these. See if you recognize them. And Judah says, Well, I'll be dead gum. <laughs> I mean, something like that, right? <laughs> it's interesting what Judah says. Look at verse 26. She's more righteous than I am. Okay, now that's really relative. I'm not sure who's righteous in this little story here. Um, I think what he means is, <laughs> she got me, okay? And I, since I didn't give her my son, Sheila, and so he didn't sleep with her again. In other words, he didn't take her in as his wife. He didn't further violate their, their code of ethics. He knew what he had done was wrong. Um, and so now he is, he's, <laughs> he's in a pickle. So then we get this interesting little note. So the time came for her to give birth, and she had twin sons. How many times can this happen? And one of the boys wants to come out first, and so the midwife ties a little string around that boy's hand, and then the next one forces his way out. And so they named the, the, the second one who was born first, Perez, which means breach. And, and the midwife says, you were breached, and then you just breached your way through. And, and then the older son, who actually is born second, is named Zira. And then the story ends. Or does it? Well, you got to keep reading. Because, again, we're going to get the blessing on Judah. We're going to get the messianic promise through Judah. And then we're going to go all the way to the New Testament. And guess who's going to be listed in the genealogy of Jesus? Tamar and Perez. Isn't that fascinating? So Matthew and Luke are going to give us this line to make sure. Now Matthew's going to take him back to Abraham, but Luke's going to take him all the way back to Adam. 
And in both accounts, Perez is going to be in the mix because he's the son of Judah. Even though he's the son of Judah by his daughter-in-law, Tamar. But Luke, and if you're, ever, if you're reading Luke, you've got to pay attention. If, if you're reading Luke, what you discover is, is that Luke takes every opportunity to elevate the role of women in the ancient world. Just notice that when you're reading Luke. Luke will mention these women's names who travel with Jesus, and he'll say something like this, and these women financed the ministry that Jesus and his apostles were engaged in. So you get to the book of Acts, and Luke will make comments. He'll say there were converts in Berea, and not a few prominent Gentile women. He'll say that in Thessalonica. He'll point these women out. So when Luke writes the genealogy of Jesus, isn't it interesting? He lists women. Now, when you read, I mean, I'm sorry, when Matthew does it, unlike Luke, Luke elevates the role of women, and unexpectedly, Matthew does it in the genealogy, which is fascinating to me. Luke constantly elevates women. Matthew elevates the story of Israel. And yet, in the lineage of Jesus, Luke is the one who says, son of, son of, son of, son of. Matthew's the one who says, well, actually, daughter of, which is really fascinating and highly unusual for a Jewish lineage. So, you got the mixture of Matthew and Luke. Both of them at some level bringing women into a story that was highly unusual in the ancient world. And it's not just any women, y'all. Go back and read Matthew 1. It's Tamar and Rahab and Ruth and Bathsheba. Now, if you want a roll call of Old Testament women... So if you were in charge and you were going to pick four women to be listed in the line of Jesus, who would you have chosen? Sarah, right? I mean, Rebecca. I mean, we we could have thought about this. Matthew says, well, Tamar, Canaanite. Rahab, Canaanite. Ruth, Moabite. Bathsheba, Hittite. All in the line of Jesus. And guess who they're listed with? Mary. (laughs) So scholars have debated why in the world these women in Matthew's list. Because you would expect this to be in Luke's list, not Matthew's. But Matthew chooses these people very particularly. So scholars debate all the reasons. Some say, well, they're women and they were sinful women. Now, Ruth gets a little bit of a pass, right? Because of what happened to her. But if you're going to go with Bathsheba and Tamar... And Rahab. Okay, those, those were women of note. But also, there's the idea of the salvation of Gentiles into the very birth narrative of Jesus. Um, now, what's interesting is, um, in the first century, there was already debate about David's line. And there were some Jews who were uncomfortable with the fact, because the people who know the story, they know these women are in David's line. They already know that. They already know that Bathsheba's a part of it. They know Tamar's a part of it. And there were Jews in the first century who wanted that kind of push to the the periphery, if you will. The Pharisees, believe it or not, were the ones who pointed out that these women, these sinners, these Gentiles were actually in this story. And so some people think Matthew put them in there as a shout out to the Pharisees to say, y'all are right, these women belong in this story. So some people think this was a little Jewish squabble that Matthew was paying attention to when he wrote this genealogy to make the genealogy more open to Pharisees, if that makes sense. And some say, well, these were all, every one of these ladies, including Mary, were in irregular marriages. And so they all have that in common. I think there's a little bit of every bit of that in it. You know, I think there's the reason Matthew chose to include these women I believe, is because they include hints of things like salvation beyond the Jews, that the Gentiles are part of this, even in the birth of Jesus himself. I do think that there were, these women had some things in common, which is the irregular nature of their marriage. I also think it's Matthew's attempt to elevate the role of women in this story, which Luke will do a lot more prominently in his writings. But the point is, this gospel is for everybody. And as tainted as we think these women are, in some ways, the ones that like Bathsheba or Rahab, there's redemption in the story. And every one of these women finds some level of redemption in their journey. Ruth would be included in that because Ruth was also lost without a husband. 
Now, they will appeal to the Leveret law, remember? And Boaz will be the one as the nearest of kin who will actually take Ruth in uh, because no one else was willing to do it. But it's a, it's a beautiful story um, when you get to the end of it. I think the reason the story is in here, as I said, is because of the prominence of Judah and the role that Judah is going to play. It's almost like Moses is letting you in early on the fact that Judah is different than the rest of his brothers because no one else will get this kind of a story and get this much press in this part of the journey outside of Joseph, who's not actually the son of promise, but he's a part of the story of redemption because he's a part of the fulfillment to Abraham that his descendants were going to go and live in a foreign land for 400 years. And Joseph is the one through whom that promise is going to be fulfilled. But Judah is going to be the line of promise, and the scepter will be given to him, and one day Jesus will come and claim that scepter. That's why he's called the Lion of Judah. All right, I'm going to stop right there. So those of you that are online, thank you for joining us, and uh, we'll see you next week. Okay.